Hello everyone, my name is Rakesh Rajani. I work with Twaweza. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you about general budget support. I've been asked to share a few thoughts. Look, in principle, I like general budget support, but in practice I don't. And let me explain why. For GBS to work, there are five essential conditions that need to be in place. And if those are in place, you could have a fantastic GBS support modality that would bring results. But if those five conditions are not in place, you can have potentially a disaster. What are those five conditions? First, number one, the government needs to have a clear strategy and have articulated it. Number two, we, the government needs to work by policy. In other words, when people wake up in the morning and a minister or a permanent secretary wakes up in the morning, he or she makes reference to the policy. That the country is governed by and the decisions are made in accordance to policy. Third, we have sufficient transparency and a quality of data that we can trust. Four, when it comes to making assessment, there is rigorous evaluation, so we can trust the evaluation of the results. And five, you have accountability. Very simply, the people who do the right thing get recognized and rewarded, and the people who screw up, who don't do according to what is agreed, face the consequences. If you have those five conditions in place, you can have a fantastic GPS. But what's the story in Tanzania? In my opinion, Tanzania fails on all five counts. Uh, all five conditions are not met. First, yes, we have a Mkukuta, yes, we have a Vision 2025. But those are not really strategies. A strategy is an expression, a document, a way of line of thinking which says, of all the things we could do, we have decided to do these things, and this is why we've decided to. These are our th the few things we've chosen. These are the ways in which we're going to leverage synergies. These are the ways in which we're going to join up the dots. Nkukuta is not that. Nkukuta is a wish list where every possible useful thing is mentioned and uh, you know here and there um, we, we happen to say all the right things but we also happen to say all the wrong things. It's, it's also, it, it's not guiding, it's not a guiding document, it's not a strategic document. Nkukuta only exists in order to please the donors. If tomorrow the donors woke up and said we don't need such a document, I doubt whether the government would have such a document. So Tanzania does not have a strategy, does not have a clear vision of where it wants to go. Number two, we assume when we get behind GBS that government actually works by policy. Because this is what happens in OECD countries most of the time. Uh, you have a whole negotiation around a policy, but once a policy is put in place, ministers wake up in the morning and uh, follow the policy. And if they don't, they're in trouble. Well, in Tanzania, that's not how decisions are made. Just even witness the political season. Witness how uh, the president goes around to ministries and what kind of commitments are made. Uh, witness how uh, you know, things are sent to parliament or how government makes its decisions. There's hardly any reference to policy. There's all kinds of things that are made contrary to policy. Contra policy is not followed. There are many, many other, um, many other considerations that govern uh, what is actually done. So, so policy kind of exists in a world of its own and real life exists of a world of The connection between the two is extremely tenuous. The third condition is about transparency and data. We, in order to be able to know what's going on, you need to have transparency. You need to have sufficient information about what is at the center but also what's down below. We have to have sufficient understanding of our money's flow. We need to have sufficient documentation around decision making. And we simply don't have that. Related to that is the issue of the integrity of the data. How do we know how well things are? If, if you know, we need to rely on administrative data in education and health and roads and money transfers. And those of us who've worked on it, and any of you who've worked on it, know the more you understand data in Tanzania, the more you understand budgets, the more you understand how real decision making is done, the more you realize how little we know. So in fact, a sign of being naive is to speak with great confidence about having the numbers and having uh, the data in place. What about the other two conditions of rigorous evaluation and accountability? Well, Tanzania is full of evaluations. I can't tell you how many donor missions doing evaluations I have met with, um, you know, how many studies are done all over the place, how many terms of reference I've been part of writing or commenting or participating in. But in my view, those evaluations rarely meet the standards of what you could call a rigorous evaluation. 
In the world out there, there is quite a bit of thinking now on what constitutes a proper evaluation, what constitutes proper evidence, how can you draw certain conclusions. And in Tanzania, we simply don't have those standards. So the, the basic model of evaluation here seems to be you find a bunch of people, often they are the same old, same old. You bring them in for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. They go around and talk to a bunch of people. They do one or two field visits, if you're lucky, and then they make their conclusions. That, according to any real standard, imagine if that was what was done in science, if scientific conclusions were made based on that kind of evaluation, we'd all be dead. Um, so that is, the, but yet that is the level of evaluation in the country. There's no rigor, there are no standards, and more or less we pick the people to say what we want them to say. Um, so we don't really learn, we don't really know what is working well and what isn't and why. Fifthly and finally, and perhaps the most importantly, there is no accountability. In, in Tanzania, uh, the government, or for that matter NGOs, and for that matter donors, whether you really do your job well or whether you do a lousy job doesn't matter. Um, the worst thing that can happen is a little bit of a reprimand, or the worst thing is you might be transferred from one ministry to another. But nobody gets held accountable. And the permanent secretary who wakes up in the morning and works damn hard to deliver results and really does a quality job, he's not really recognized compared to the guy who just doesn't rock the boat, takes no initiative and does nothing. So why should somebody care? Why should somebody stick their neck out, take risks to do something right when they're not going to get rewarded? If anything, there's some evidence to suggest that when you stick your neck out, that's when you get punished. When you try to go and do something unusually better is when you're likely to get into trouble. So the culture of government, and in many ways the culture it seems also of NGOs and donors, most NGOs and donors, is to just keep on saying more of the same. Um, so those five conditions are not met in Tanzania. And in that context, giving budget support is unfortunately often like pouring money down the drain. Of course you're going to get some good. Of course you don't have a completely rapacious state. Of course, some good is going to happen when you throw hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to a system. And there are some good things that have happened. But on the whole, we don't have value for money. On the whole, too much money gets wasted. On the whole, we don't focus on the results we need. Let me concretize why, what do I mean in terms of lack of results by way of one example. Let me look at the education sector, which is the sector I know best. Um, if anything, Tanzania is often accorded, often by the donors, praise for what it has achieved in education. The, uh, last year in New York at the Wild of Astoria, Tanzania received a big award for having achieved its MDG on education before time. Um, but look at what's going on in education. Let me just give you three facts. The first is, if you look at the money we are spending in education, it's gone up. We have a threefold increase in the last 10 years in terms of money. This is both donor support as well as government's own revenues. So we do have plenty of money now being spent in education and many of us activists in some ways have succeeded in making the case for education. About one out of every five dollars the government spends goes to education. But what does it do? Well first, a really important aspect of the education reforms was to get the money to schools, the capitation grant. It was a very modest amount, $10 per child per year. That's all, just $10 per child per year. That's less than $1 per month per child. That was supposed to reach primary schools. When the reform started, there was a study two years later in 2004 of PETS that showed only six of the $10 was getting to the schools. And there was an outcry. Why only six out of the $10 is getting to the schools? And there was lots of promises from government, we want to make sure everything works right, lots of technical support, lots of this, that and the other. Five years later, that's what it took to do another study, because there was a lot of resistance on the part of government and also some donors. Well, what did the 2009 study show? At the same time at which the money for the education sector has gone up, that only four dollars out of the ten was reaching the school. So now, things are getting worse, and instead of perhaps more money getting to school, less than $4 per child per year was getting to the schools. That means if there's a school with 500 children, you telling the head teacher, run this school with $2,000 for your whole school. And that's all you have. It's a joke. 
Well, you could say that's because the money is going to secondary. It isn't. In fact, the situation in the evidence shows that in secondary education, the capitation grant is even worse. To give you one example, the government and the World Bank in their agreement had agreed to disperse 10,000 shillings in January 2011. We did a SNAP survey in 50 schools, 14 regions, together with Hakke Limo and the Policy Forum, and we found that in those 50 schools, 93% of them had received nothing, and the few schools that had received money had received on average 500 shillings. 500 shillings in today's day and age. Tell me if that's not a joke. So the money is not reaching the schools. Well, what about the teachers? Because everybody would argue that teachers are the most important thing. Um, we have lots of teachers. We've expanded the number of teachers. But the question is, are they teaching? It's a recent study. I don't think it's been formally published yet, done by the World Bank and others, APHRC, which looked very carefully at how much time teachers are doing being school and teaching. But what you find, that in rural areas, teachers are on average teaching two hours and four minutes a day. That's it. Not eight hours, but two hours and four minutes a day. In urban areas where you could say it might be better because of distance. Well, in urban areas we find, they find, that teachers are teaching for one hour and 24 minutes a day. So here we have potentially the largest rent-seeking example in Tanzania. That you have close to 200,000 teachers who are teaching for perhaps a quarter of the time that they should be teaching, maybe a third. If you, if you count in preparation time, and they're getting paid their salaries, and yet they are absent on duty three quarters of the time or two thirds of the time. We haven't even talked about the quality of teaching, the pedagogy and the effectiveness. Finally, what really matters is learning outcomes. Uh, we know from the UESO data uh, that has been done at a very, very large scale across the country, that in fact children are not learning. Uh, a standard two-level test was administered to all children aged 5 to 16. And because it's a standard two test, well then at the standard three level, everybody should have got 100% on it. What do we find? We find that in Kiswahili, the subject that Tanzanians know best, seven out of 10 in standard three were not able to do the standard two test. Eight out of 10 were not able to do the mathematics, and nine out of 10 were not able to do the English test. 90% of the children were not able to do the level of English that they were supposed to do. You could say, well, perhaps there's a lag effect, they will catch up. For if you take the standard seven children, for example, with the English test, you find that half of them, even after they complete standard seven, are not able to do the standard two level test. So you complete primary school, you're going into secondary school that is taught in English, and yet you cannot do the standard two level test, which is being able to read sentences like, this is a cat. And you expect somebody who can't do that to be able to thrive in secondary. It also is a joke. You could say for the form four results finally, well, at the same time in which the money has been going up, let's look at what's happening to the results. These are the form four 10th grade results overall. You can see that there was a slight increase and now a decrease. In the last Form 4 results, which were released a few months ago at the end of 2010, what you find is that something like 90% of the children who set those exams were not able to get Division 1, 2 or 3. In other words, they got a D or an F. They do not have the competence. So here we have an education system supported, among others, by general budget support that is simply failing, catastrophically failing to educate our children. And yet billions of dollars go into education every year of both government and GBS resources. I, they, one could say similar stories around health, water, roads and many other things. But this gives you a sense of how the current system without the five conditions in place ends up not supporting Tanzania. Well, what should be done? Uh, you might say I'm cynical. I'm actually not cynical. I'm incredibly optimistic about what is happening in the country. It's just not the stuff that the development partners are supporting. Well, what could you do to contribute more effectively to Tanzanians and the development of Tanzania? I have five very simple ideas. And they're harder to shape and implement, but not impossible. 
And I think if you focus on those five ideas, you do a much better good in the country. What are these five? First, get money to people. This huge amount of money that both donors and government are putting in here is simply not getting to people on the ground. It's not getting to the communities. Figure out ways in which you get money to the people. Second, focus on outcomes. Get out of the way of thinking about capacity building and training and new modalities and all of this sort of stuff. Get to focus on a few outcomes. Have a path that isn't focused on intermediate steps. Get out of the business of saying, hey, let's have a new law in place or let's have an anti-corruption bureau or let's have a NACSAP. You know, that's a joke. Focus on real outcomes that matter on people's lives and make sure that you see, we're clear with the government that the government has to deliver that for its people. And if it does, it gets rewarded and otherwise it doesn't. And let the government figure out how it gets there. Third, do radical transparency. By radical transparency, I don't mean a disbursement being published in one newspaper once a quarter. I mean being able to know exactly what is happening on the ground, being able to follow the money, being able to know things at a very granular level. And these days, technology allows us to do that in very interesting ways. Fourth, set the incentives right and set the incentives at the right level. If you look at how the incentives are arrayed right now, if there ever was a study done of what are the incentives on government to perform right now, you realize that they are very perverse. For anybody who really tries to do something right, they are likely to be punished. And the best way to get along, the best way to survive, the best way to do well is to go with the status quo. And fifth, experiment. I've become a big believer in experimenting, carefully well-designed experiments so that we can learn. Be bold, take some risks, figure out a way of experimenting and rigorously learning what's going on, rather than going by faith and designing whole approaches and policies and putting hundreds of millions of dollars behind something that essentially goes by faith. So those are the five things, again, to reiterate. One, get money to people. Two, focus on outcomes. Three, do radical transparency. Four, set the incentives right. And five, experiment. Now, in closing, let me give you a few concrete examples that I think you might want to look at. They take you beyond general budget support. They, in some ways, question some of the new orthodoxy that you have. Um, they question some of the thinking behind Paris and Accra. But I think these are worth thinking about seriously. These are desperate times in Tanzania. Uh, the whole country senses a deep lack of, there's a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, a couple of days ago, the central committee of the ruling party resigned. That's a sign that even the ruling party is getting it. The country is, in a, is, is going through a moment of saying, we need to do something deeply different. And I think you as donors, if you kind of are just tinker about and do a little bit here and a little bit there, you are just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's about time you also caught up with the rest of the country and tried to do something different. Well, what are some of the examples that I think you may want to consider? The first is a cash on delivery. As you know, uh, I, I uh, like this idea. I promoted it with some donors uh, for the last two and a half years now. I've done sessions at the Umoja House and at uh, you know, the, the Finnish-Swedish uh, conference hall and others. Uh, it doesn't seem to be getting much traction. I hope, I hope maybe the moment is right now. Cash on delivery is an idea developed by the Center for Global Development. Uh, there's a whole book on it. Uh, I have a couple of copies I'm happy to share with you guys. Uh, but the idea is simply, it's on top of existing aid modalities. And it simply says, why don't we agree on one outcome, agree on a rigorous and independent way of measuring that outcome, and then give the gun money to government based on achievement of that outcome. So for example, if the outcome is improve literacy and numeracy according to an agreed level uh, for children who finish primary school, uh, then you could say to the government, for every child who finishes at that level, we will give you $100. How the government gets it there is up to them. What they do, whether they supply more books or provide better teachers or build more classrooms or uh, give a, set up a prize for the best head teachers and they all get a car, whatever the government does is up to itself. 
What you need to make sure is have a clear outcome that's measured and that matters. So it shouldn't be something silly like enrollment, but it should be something like learning outcomes. There should be a rigorous and independent and credible way of measuring that outcome, and then you put money behind it. I think it's an idea that's worth looking at. I'm happy to come and do a presentation in greater detail if you want. Uh, the Center for Global Development people, Nancy Birdsall and others, may also be willing to do that. They have offered to do so in the past. Tuawezi specifically is uh, speaking with DFID and others to try to experiment with cash on delivery at a local level and we'd like to do that and we're working on that and if anybody is interested on how we're going to experiment with that, I'd be glad to talk with you. A second idea that I think I know many of you have been thinking about and I think is worth seriously considering uh, doing in Tanzania is cash transfers. We now have through M-Pesa, Zap and other ways of mo sending mobile money through mobile banking. We have ways in which we can get money to people fast, cheaply and reliably. And I think this is worth thinking about seriously. I know that there have been some experimentation involving the Japanese and others. I think we should look at it carefully and think about doing this in a very serious way. One interesting question here, of course, is whether to make them conditional or not. Uh, my gut feeling is to say if there was a way of making them conditional on something very, very simple and very, very uh, easy to administer and that mattered, it would probably be better because I recorded the idea of free money. But my concern is that we are unlikely to be able to make it conditional in an ele elegant way, in which case it is better to do unconditional cash transfers, but at a serious level. A third thing is around the whole information architecture. I think we are stuck in trying to improve little, you know, improvements here with NBS and administrative systems and you know, a few surveys here and there. I think we, we need to think much more radically. We need to think much more 2.0. Uh, we need to create an open architecture uh, where, on which on one hand we require the government at the granular level, at the facility level, at the school level, clinic level and so on, to release radical information, even at the expenditure, down to every voucher should be made uh, open. In Brazil, for example, they have done it, and in Indonesia they are working on ways of doing it. And then that should be complemented by this open architecture where anybody, a school teacher, an activist, a parent, a local NGO person, a pastor, an imam, anyone can come and add information to that. It's clear where the information is coming from so we can see. So for example, I should be able to go and see right down to my school level and get the information about that school. How many kids are there? How many books? What about the toilets and water facilities? How well do they do? Are the teachers teaching? And to be able to get that information from government, but also from surveys, and also from uh, citizens themselves. And it's that level of radical open information, I think, that will give us the data, that will give us the information we need of what's going on on the ground. I am I'm astonished as to how few of us in Dar es Salaam, both in the government and the donor and the NGO side, know how little of really what's going on on the ground. Uh, one concrete way also of doing this is to set up monitoring, an ongoing citizen monitoring system, which is what Tuawesa is experimenting with. Uh, for example, one of the ideas we have is that in 250 communities, uh, somewhat randomly chosen across the country, uh, we have individuals who are living there already, who get trained, and every month they report on certain information. We have to think carefully about the incentives, we have to think carefully about the training, we have to think carefully about what uh, fears and constraints there might be. But can you imagine if you got quality, rigorous data every month coming from the ground, coming up, being available in real time on a website as well as reports and briefs? That would bridge this incredible gap we have right now between the top and the world of policy and GBS and PATH and so forth and the reality on the ground. That's just one example. There are other examples we're working on through mobile phone monitoring, through something called One Inchi Survey that we're experimenting to set up, where people get through a call center asked information through their mobile phone. You could ask them 10 questions every week, for example. That's something else we're working on. And there are many, many other ways which we could do this. Um, to do those three things, um, experiment with, a, with an incentive-based system of results performance like cash on delivery, get money to communities through something like cash transfers, 
that are incredibly transparent so that everybody knows what they are supposed to get and for what. And to have a radically transparent, open architectural information system and monit citizen monitoring system gives you the building blocks to try to support our government to make sure it delivers to its citizens. So, in conclusion, um, I think you have a real opportunity in front of you. I know that many of you are sensing a, a sense of, uh, of being stuck, a sense of frustration about how can you support the government to deliver to its citizens. We've shared some ideas with you that I think are worth trying. Are there guarantees? Will they work for sure? I don't know. They may not work. But I think it's worth thinking very seriously about doing something different, something that's bold, something that's more creative, something that focuses on outcomes, something that gets the incentives right, and something that makes sure that there is radical transparency so that not only the GBS partners or not only the donors and a few CSOs, but everybody in the country knows what's going on. Because at the end of the day, I believe this government, whether it's this government or a different government, will do the right thing when they are compelled to do so by its own people. And I think there's one thing you should always keep at the back and at the front of your mind. And to ask yourself, is what you're doing empowering the citizens of Tanzania to know what's going on, to be able to hold their own governments to account? All the innovations that I've suggested to you, unconditional cash transfers, cash on delivery, radical transparency, all of those things, if you look at them carefully, lend themselves to making the link between citizens and their own government stronger, more powerful. If you do them right, there's a greater chance that when that woman in Sumbawanga wakes up in the morning, when that young man in Kirumba in Mwanza wakes up in the morning, they both feel there is more they can do, there is more they know of, and there's more ways in which they can hold the government accountable. And when that permanent secretary or that minister or that district education officer wakes up in the morning, you want them to sense that I better deliver to my citizens, otherwise I'll be in trouble. And everything that you do needs to lend itself to making more of that possible. So good luck, happy thinking, and I hope this has been useful to you. Thank you very much.